This episode of Muddy River Gems is brought to you by Dot Foods. I think what it comes down to is the culture and the people. Our culture here at Dot is like no other. I've never experienced anything like what I've lived with for the last 12 years. Dot is very diverse. It is truly a family-owned business, but it is a family inside and out. You always feel like you matter and you play a big hand in the pot. There's so many opportunities to make a difference at DOT and really contribute to the success of the organization. A largely unknown gem near Quincy. On this edition of Muddy River Gems, brought to you by DOT Foods, we tour the 1930s Agriculture Museum. Don McKinley, if, I, if my memory serves right, you, your career was as an educator. That's correct. Um, but then when you retired, you continued educating because what you did was you, you built a farm museum, an agriculture museum. And if I recall right, it's because you wanted mostly kids to understand that food didn't come from the grocery store, food came from the farm, and they had to know a little about it, right? That's exactly right. Let, let me take you back to uh, this tractor. Uh, we took this tractor to Mount Pleasant, Iowa, to the old Thrasher's Union and set it along with probably 700 other pre-1939 tractors. And as we were sitting there, row after row of these old tractors, a father and son walked by. And I, and I heard the son look up, or saw him look up at dad and said, yeah, dad, but what did they do with them? Mm -hmm. Son was probably eight years old. Mm -hmm. Dad looked down at him and said, they farmed with them, mm -hmm. period. That was all. And I thought, dad, gum it, that's, that's, <laughs> that. Kid's eager for information and he's not getting any, huh? And he's not getting any. Yeah. <laughs> I came home and told my family, I want to surround this tractor with everything it could have pulled or powered in the decade of the 30s and, and start a museum with that stuff around it. So this tractor started the museum with that a, kid in Mount Pleasant. Let, let's just take a look around. And this is an incredible ordeal that you, that you took on here. This is a big building and it is absolutely stuffed with 1930s yes. era farm equipment and, uh, and items for the house. and. The, everything that anybody would have needed there's to nothing get in here newer than 1940. wow now yeah. there's stuff older than the 1930s because again we're in a depression period in yeah. the 1930s and and no uh, you didn't during the depression you didn't throw anything away mm -hmm. i don't care <laughs> rural or urban you mm -hmm. didn't throw anything mm -hmm. away you might need it 1930. So this John Deere is a this is a beautiful beautiful thing. You and your son-in-law Marvin really work hard, worked hard on these vehicles. Didn't you? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. And and again, the whole philosophy of the museum is uh, education mm -hmm. and pre preservation primarily. Mm -hmm. Let's preserve it. They're not making any more of this right, stuff. Right. Right. I also like to emphasize, Mark. If you'd walked into a 1930s uh, farmstead and found the equipment in, on that farmstead as you find in here, you got to realize this is as good as it got. There wasn't anything better in the world mm -hmm. in the decade of the 30s mm -hmm. than the equipment you find in this, in this building right now. Mm -hmm. And, and so, when you say worldwide, the U.S. was out in front on producing equipment absolutely. like this. Huh? Absolutely. Yeah. And, then, and then look what, where we are today. So here in my lifetime, in my lifetime from 1930s to 2024, my goodness, 
<laughs> we have combines that drive themselves and that's themselves. correct. Even, that's I mean, correct. with the geo positioning yeah. and everything, my goodness. Now, okay, but but everything not in here is not from the '30s. You liked the, the transition from when there were actually when, before we had that's horse correct. power. We actually had horses. That's correct. Yeah. And so you've got some buggies in here from 1901. That one in the back yes. is 1901, yeah. and then the one closer to us. And these are called these are called Veli buggies, Vili. right? And he had a connection, didn't he? He, Vili. It, yeah, uh, the Willard Veely was a grandson of John Deere, uh -huh. and he served on John Deere's board of directors mm -hmm. for many years, and then dropped off and started his own business. Wow, these are beautiful specimens too. I mean, look at look at how clean and oh, that's beautiful. It's, that would have been really a top. The Veely buggy we're looking at right now would have been a top grade, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. The, the, we have an Amish friend that helped us with this. Mm -hmm. And he said this would have been uh, a teenager's, uh, what do you call them, open, the teenagers of today's. Yeah. Uh, oh, convertible. Convertible. Okay, okay. <laughs> and he would have loved to have put his girlfriend in it and oh, drove up and down the sure, street. Sure, oh, sure. It's, it's, uh, it's fairly unusual. The model is fairly unusual. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But I think it's an interesting, yeah. it's an undercut. You see how the horse can come, that wheel can go under the buggy. He can turn around in fairly short. Oh, okay. Mm hmm Got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know, Don, we, we mentioned your son-in-law, Marvin, who helped you with a lot of this stuff. Yes. I want to visit with him a little bit because he, he put a lot of this together. We're going to come back with you right. um, later in the program, but but Marvin's got to, got to talk to him. In fact, Marvin, his name is Huber, right? His name and there's a tractor over there that named Huber. I don't suppose there's any connection there. <laughs> You're going to have to talk to him. Okay. <laughs> well, there. Marvin, I've mentioned you and your name a couple of times so far. Marvin Huber, your son-in-law right. of Don, um, and you are you're kind of partners in this yeah. museum, aren't you? Did partners you come up with crime, an idea yeah. at the same time, like in 2003 or maybe even before that? Y'all said, you know, we, we, we're, we're collectors anyways. Maybe right. we should make this available to everybody. That's that's very true, Mark. We had gone to several shows exhibiting, you know, some of our implements and tractors that we had restored, mm -hmm. and. Uh, we kind of on a same basis, you know, hey, let's do a preservation education museum. Mm -hmm. And that's how we kind of mm -hmm. started putting this This together. building then, did, did you build this with that in mind or yes. was this building here for another no, purpose? No, no it was you built, built this for the purpose, museum. Yeah. Wow. So, and so you have really in that a short amount, relatively short amount of time, 21 years, mm -hmm. made, it had an enormous collection. Yes, yeah. A lot of the stuff had been bought at farm auctions over the years, stored away. Mm -hmm. and, fence rows or buildings and then when we decided to start putting this stuff together in a museum we started bringing that stuff out mm -hmm. and, you know that we tried to put it into an order where you have your tillage equipment then the planting equipment and then the harvest equipment and coming around mm -hmm. and then kind of down the middle of the museum is the everyday items that you use mm -hmm. you know the shelling of corn the grinding of corn, you know, for feed yeah. and what have you. Right. And, and then and we decided to put and then the also, mesmanine. Well, yeah, up here, what you've done here, this is what the household, household of the farm household would have needed. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, so you, you, you grow and you harvest all this stuff and then you got to do something with it and that's what you do up here is you right. process it, huh? Right, right. Um, now, I'm standing in front of a, there's no connection between Marvin Huber and this Huber truck <laughs> tractor, is there? Well, <laughs> with that tractor, I always, <laughs> wanted one because I discovered that they had a manufacturing company and we had a place over in eastern Illinois, an auction. So we went over there and come to find out the original owner still owned it. Mm -hmm. I was talking to his grandson. We were lucky enough to get it bought that day on the auction. Mm -hmm. So then another friend of mine had some literature from the Huber manufacturing, which had been closed for years. but serial numbers and who bought the stuff. Well, this tractor was built in Marion, Ohio. Mm -hmm. My dad's name was Marion Huber, and the original owner bought it the day my dad was born in <laughs> January 1927. <laughs> okay. So it was like it was there waiting yeah. for me and had to be. 
So this is even older than the one Don showed us. Yes, that was a yeah. 36. This is a 26, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. And uh, and and they, they had come a long way. There's some features about this that they kind of gave up making, didn't they? They they just stopped using. Well, when the war period come along, they they also made uh, like earth moving equipment and what have you. And so they started focusing toward the war effort and after they manufactured, uh, the war was over, they kept on making the earth moving equipment mm -hmm. because they, they only built over 13,000 of the Huber tractors. That B John Deere, John Deere made over 300,000 Wow. Of those tractors. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they decided to focus on what they were doing yeah. best. Yeah. And so this is pretty rare. It is. Yeah, that yeah. many of these yeah. were made yeah. to begin with. Yeah. Now, you really like, let's go over here. We yeah. talked about, of course, Illinois was corn country primarily in the 30s. Sure. And uh, if you didn't have a corn picker, I guess you were pretty much out of luck, huh? You're going to have to do it by hand. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is, this is 30s era here? Yeah, 1931. It's beautiful. Well, it, it wasn't like that when we started. <laughs> I bet it wasn't. <laughs> Mac and I completely disassembled this thing, every last oh nut and bolt goodness. out of it. Yeah. Sandblasted everything, was able to have a company in Quincy do the new galvanized sheet metal, mm -hmm. and they, they did a fabulous job. I mean, it, it was almost like it was ordered from John Deere to put replace. Oh. But we got it all painted and put together and taken it to a show and there happened to be one of John Deere's employees there who was operating at the time their collector's museum in Moline. And he asked me, he said, what are you guys going to do with this after the show? And mm -hmm. I said, well, we'll take it home, put it back in the museum. Well, he said, I'd like to have that on display in our collector center mm -hmm. here in Moline, he said, for maybe six months or so. And I said, yeah, sure. Well, a year and a half later, we finally <laughs> were able to get it back from him. <laughs> But, uh, he broke his heart too when you he took well, it back. Yeah, it was time to change the display, <laughs> I think. But it, uh, it, it we kind of gained a, a lot of, I guess, respect or reputation for the quality mm -hmm. of the restorations we were wow. doing. Several other implements in here that we restored that yeah. caught their eyes. And this is from 1931. 1931, yeah. yes. It yeah. is beautiful. Look, pa if you just look past. That up on the wall there, you okay. see about, uh, gee, I, yeah, well, uh, what about decades and decades, or maybe centuries worth of tack that uh, uh, would have been bits. used for horse bits. Uh, my oh. wife Kathy is an avid horse bit collector. And that's her collection. That's huh? her collector. Can we talk to her next? Yeah, I think huh? that'd be a good okay. idea because she's got a project <laughs> she's just finished there, so okay. she can tell you about that. Neat. Well, Kathy, we were just mentioning like this, this enormous tack collection that's here. You used to be in the tack business, by the way. That's correct. And, but, so you started collecting these bits, and there are bits here from like hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Uh, do, any idea how many bits you have? I don't, haven't counted them. I've curated the collection, yeah. and I'm eliminating some of them and cataloging them, putting yeah. numbers on them, um, getting pictures of them, and kind of putting the value on them. So Someday if something happens to me, Marvin won't take them to a garage sale. <laughs> <laughs> Any idea? Like, give me a ballpark. How many do you think there are? Well, probably over a thousand. Okay. okay. Trying to keep it at a thousand. Huh? Something yes. reasonable, like a thousand bits. T show me what you're holding here, because I asked you to dig out some really old ones. And, and like you say, bits haven't changed that much, have they? No, they haven't. Horses haven't changed, and we've mm -hmm. used horses for centuries. Mm -hmm. And this one um, is very ancient, and it could have been used... A knight would have used this over in what is now current day Europe. Mid mid middle Ages possibly. Yes, huh? Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. And this one is the same thing. And they didn't have, of course, spring steel. These are made out of iron and they didn't have spring steel. So they coiled mm -hmm. and wrapped metal around there and put pressure on it. So it would work as a snap, what mm -hmm. we would know mm -hmm. as a current snap. And that would mm -hmm. hook to the bridle or the head stall. And of course, your reins would go here. Where I'm holding would be in the horse's mouth. Mm -hmm. And are bits still about that same? Or are they smaller than that these days? It depends on the size. These, both of these were very large horses, mm -hmm. which they needed to carry all the material with mm -hmm. the knights. And Well, let's move ahead to the Civil War here. And I'll take okay. those off your hands while you hold these. Okay. okay. 
And we have two bits here. The one that's marked U.S. was a Union, mm -hmm. and this is a Confederate bit. Um, it amazes me, you can see the difference. This bit was manufactured mm -hmm. in a regular company. This bit was hand forged mm -hmm. by a blacksmith yeah. at some point. You can see, you can see certainly that it's, it's a much rougher product, isn't it? Right, yeah. Yeah. right. And the union had specifications, mm -hmm. you know, for how they manufactured these, and they had four different ports, and that's what a port is what goes in a horse's mouth. Mm -hmm. And some are higher, some were lower. Um, and I just I find these fascinating. And this one is a little off center. Of course, it's been you know it was hand forged and yeah. probably done in a hurry because they needed mm -hmm. the product. Yeah, and that poor horse got one that was not symmetrical, and he had to he had to fight that all the time. Right. I'll bet. And that probably was the least of the horse's problems with <laughs> probably, the battles hopefully. going on. This is really neat. I don't know. I, I just like it because it's a piece of art, and yes. it works the same way as any other bit, right? Except yes. it's just really. I, well, yeah, Gene Autry had something similar to yeah, this. Gene Autry, riding champion, yeah. had yeah. something like this. <laughs> this was in the '40s or the '50s. It's made out of aluminum. Um, hold it here where you can sure. see it. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, it has a low port, and it, it's not heavy because it is made out of yeah, aluminum. If yeah. it wasn't, it would be very heavy for Easier the horse. Easier on the horse, I'll bet, right? That's correct. Yeah, Because you, you, you really don't need that five pounds of stuff in your mouth, even right. if you're a thousand pound animal. Right. right. Okay. Nice. Nice. Well, listen, this is, and, and another thing, I mean, we're going to mention this, that this museum is largely open to the public by appointment, but people can, uh, can come in here and wander through here and see a thousand, a thousand bits, and it's just, a, it's just a, a remarkable achievement, I think. Thank you. All right, thank you. We'll be back for more from the 1930s Agriculture Museum on this edition of Muddy River Gems, brought to you by Dot Foods. From our trucks, to their lunch trays, to your local hospital, to your favorite pub, and to your kitchen table. For more than 60 years, Dot Foods and Dot Transportation have been stocking the shelves of your hometown. Sure, we've grown a lot, but at our core, we're still small town, family run businesses that care about our communities and the people who keep us running. Join the Dot family today and be part of something bigger. Why work at that? You could list out individual qualities forever. There's a lot of opportunities. They take care of the employees. They take care of the community. So our pay, our benefits, it's competitive. Time off, tons of flexibility. They're willing to work with you to help you advance. Connie, has your dad always been a collector? Not always. Not no? when he was working professionally, but after he started retiring, well, even before that some. You know, there'd be a collection of stuff mm -hmm. in a barn somewhere. Mm -hmm. But especially after he retired, he really got into it, and mm -hmm. that's been a long time now. He it's retired in the mid-'80s. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's a true passion, isn't it? It is I a mean, passion to, to, and a love. To want to build this enormous structure yes. and fill it with uh, evidence yes. of, of how, how human life has changed on the farm and, mm -hmm. and not just on the farm but all of us who eat food that were built or that was grown on a farm we've all developed from this from yes. this whole yes this whole and life. it's not stuff that's just thrown together I mean he's planned it out and he's arranged it and organized it and labeled things and mm -hmm. done hundreds of hours of research on mm -hmm. things it's Pretty amazing. Did you ever go on trips with him to go pick stuff up or go look at stuff? I've or gone on au to auctions with him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, does he yeah. usually come back with something? <laughs> that depends. <laughs> if the price is right. If the price is and right and it's it, something huh? he really yeah. wants, yes. Um, you, 
you also have a lot to do with this. I mean, you all do. All, all four of, the, of you that we're talking to today have a lot to do with, with keeping this place going. But you, I mean, you, somebody has to take care of all this stuff and keep it clean and keep it presentable and keep the webs off of it. And you yes, do and a little bit of that, don't yes, you? Yes, I wasn't so involved in collecting all the things because I didn't live here for 40 years. Mm -hmm. But in the last five, I've been more involved in helping. My main job, I call myself the housekeeper. <laughs> you know, we get a lot of spider webs, a lot of bugs, wasps, things like yeah, that. And, yeah. and it takes a lot. There's a lot in here to clean. Sure, sure is. And I'm not the only one. We all pitch in. Mm -hmm. People used to plant corn by hand, and there's a display over here of, of, mm -hmm. of some items that would have been used for that. But we're standing next to uh, one of the first corn planters that would have been actually taken. You wouldn't have to walk the field and do it by hand. You'd have right. a horse that would walk right. the field. You'd drive this implement and co plant corn as you went. Yes. This is really kind of, this, an this freed up a lot of stuff, didn't it? It did, and they were able to be much more productive because they could do a lot more in, in a day than they could do by hand mm -hmm. walking it. Mm -hmm. Th this, this, this picture kind of shows how it would have been. You have a team of horses, and then you got a boy on the front of, of this corn planter, yes. and he's actually operating this he handle would, here, which drops the corn in, right? Yes, he sits on that board, mm -hmm. and that handle is connected into that box where there's a plate in there with holes in it, mm -hmm. and every oh, sure. time he gets to the right spot in the field, which has been pre-marked. Mm -hmm. Then he pulls the handle and drops the seed. A couple ears of, or a couple kernels of corn will fall out. A couple, out. okay, all right. Mm -hmm. And and that's what that's what this looks like. This holds the corn, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, it's it, underneath that. Okay. And his dad or uncle or whoever's man in this thing is sitting sitting up here. <laughs> sitting up here. We're going in that direction. Yes. And we've got a team of horses. Mm -hmm hooked up to it. It's it's on it's on wheels, but it's also digging in with these uh with I'm not sure what those are called, but in the furrows. It's making furrows as it goes. Yes. And they are they're down in the ground and they're cutting as it goes. Mm -hmm. And then the seed falls in what's cut and as the then the wheels go over it, which are wide, and they cover okay, up. Okay, that the, tamps it down. it down. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's Tamp that's that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you got to turn this thing. What happens when you want to turn it? Well, you get to the end of the field. They get to the end and the driver, dad or whoever it is, has been sitting up here and he slides back on this seat and it lifts the uh, those blades. The blades yeah. out of the ground mm -hmm. and then the whole thing turns around. Mm -hmm. The team turns it around. He gets lined up and he moves back to the front of this seat, back up here, wow. and they go back down and he goes down the next row. <laughs> pretty, it pretty seems smart. Pretty complicated, but mm -hmm. it was a lot uh, better than man in one of those oh, hand seaters absolutely. all day long. And nowadays, you'll have a combine or a planter that'll have like 48, you know, boxes yes. of corn that that go up and down a row and plant 48 rows at a time. Yes, <laughs> you and can this, was, this is a George Brown. Corn okay. planter. Mm -hmm. And it's this made was made about, in Illinois, this was, wasn't it? This particular one was made in 1855. There were 300 of them made. So we're very blessed. Only 300. That yeah. we have this. Mm -hmm. It's quite mm -hmm. an invention. Perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you for doing that. Well, I, you're very You ladies, welcome. I know you didn't, it's not your favorite thing to do, but I appreciate it. Well, Don, you got a great family that helps you out here. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> one of the one of the newer additions to this has been uh, this rope that we see above us here. And the reason you have this rope hanging here is so you can show the evolution of farming from five or ten thousand years ago to where we are now. And what we're going to do is take a little trip through time here with you. Okay. Fine. Um, Fine. We started out in I think you have 10,000 BC here, where there was almost nothing agriculturally going on. Well, archaeologists tell us that that uh, at 10,000, man, the, the nomad land, man, settled down and began to domesticate his plants and his animals. Mm -hmm. That was the first evidence worldwide where he settled down and stayed in one spot and began to raise mm -hmm. without having to move all the time. Okay. And they say most archaeologists will agree that occurred around the 10,000 BC mm -hmm. area era. 
mark this rope or present it's a 50 foot rope and every four foot of the rope represents a thousand years okay so as we go from 10,000 we're going down to the next to the 8,000 okay that's what we're looking at now in other words 2,000 years stone homes okay and archaeologists tell us that hey these stone tools the pieces of agricultural equipment, the stone tools were used to loosen up the soil, plant, mm -hmm. and harvest. So here we are at, mm -hmm. 2,000 years after we started. Okay. Let's go on down here to the 5,000 5, years now from where we started. We have this, we have this furrow stick yeah. used to, 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 to Pull a furrow in the soil, drop the seeds in, then then cover up the seeds. Mm -hmm. So so here we are, man. Five thousand years it took him mm -hmm. to get to using an implement that he found helped him. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here, here we go at three thousand five hundred or three thousand three hundred, and we have the first known wheel actual wheel that was found in a bog in in poland not too awful long ago but it is an actual wooden wheel mm -hmm. and uh, it, and i like to stop right there at 3300 bc and say to the people who are visiting look around you at the wheels mm -hmm. involved in the equipment that we have in the museum. Would have been impossible to develop any of this without that first wheel. That's right. Okay, and that That's was in a bog, so it was preserved. There yes. may be many, many, yes. many more that we haven't, haven't Here we found. are at 1500 mm -hmm. BC, and we have evidence of the first plow uh, in, in uh, I get, I, it's pulled by c cattle, what do you call them? Mm -hmm. Oxen. Oxen. Mm -hmm. Pulled by mm -hmm. the oxen. First evidence of it. Here we are at 475 BC, still before Christ, and the first iron plow comes, we found uh -huh. it in China. Let's go on. We have the birth of Christ here at mm -hmm. zero, or near zero. Uh, I put in the 900 to the 1450 era. A.D. now we're 900 years after Christ, the birth of Christ, the Mississippian period, and these we find these people were very good farmers for the for the period. Yeah. By the way, Cahoka in down St. Louis. Yeah. A huge 10,000 people maybe at one time. Yeah. How did they eat? What did they eat? Mm -hmm. We find that. Places like Lewistown, what's the, the the museum over on the Illinois River? Mm -hmm. Those guys had Cahoka had satellite groups out around raising their food and shipping it down. That's why these guys became farmers. Our job is to eat, not or raise not only our food, but we got to ship down to, okay. down to, to Cahoka. Look how fast things start to happen. From I'm looking at the 1800s now, Absolutely. 1860, right? The yes. Civil War period. Look how fast things happen. Yeah. I guess yeah. what happened is the West has opened up now, and we found out that that you can actually mass produce uh, tools and and implements and all the things you need. Look at this is two hundred basically a two hundred and fifty year period. I call it the manpower period. But look at their planning or pre planning implements. Mm -hmm. And these are the what they used had to use for the planning. And these are what all of they had to use for their harvesting. Most of this stuff a farmer in two hundred and fifty years in this country could carry his tools to the field on his back. Mm -hmm. Uh, by the way, at 1850, 90% of the workforce in the United States worked on the farm. Mm -hmm. They had to, mm -hmm. just to feed themselves. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, today, by the way, something like 
one percent. One percent. Yeah, and look how much more we produce with that one yes. percent of people. Yes. But here's here's a reason why. Look look at the picture of this. This is probably one of those twenty four or forty eight forty eight row forty eight planters. row planters. That's I mean, right. my goodness, you can take fifteen thousand acres and plant it in a few days. Yes, yes, that thing will plant. Uh, they say a hundred acres an hour. <laughs> wow. So going back, we've we've gotten into the horsepower period. Only a period of about eighty years here. Yeah. But when we brought horses into the, onto the farm, now we have an entirely different group mm -hmm. of pre-planting, planting and harvesting mm -hmm. equipment. And that has to be made. That has to be um, uh, invented and made. Mm -hmm. right. Then we go on to the tractor era. And, uh, another 60 years we have listed in yeah. here are an additional set. Now mm -hmm. we have to have a whole new set of yep. farming equipment. Finally, we get to the, we, I call it the, the uh, precision farming period where satellites are involved uh -huh. and all of that. I'd like to point out this uh, chart, 1850, 1840, it took man 275 hour, man hours of labor pre-planting, planting, harvesting, to produce 100 bushel of wheat. Mm -hmm. 275 hours he worked his head off to get 100 bushel of wheat. Today, our modern farmer can do it in 15 minutes. It's, you talk about an evolution. We've gone almost straight up here mm -hmm. in the last 400 years. And I ask, why didn't this happen way back down the line? Before Christ, after AD, mm -hmm. you know, why didn't it happen back there? I get lots of answers, but I think the basic answer is the Constitution of the United States. Those dudes gave us freedoms that, that mm -hmm. no other place in the world at that time had them. And with that freedom, look what happened. Boom! We just the evolution of agricultural almost went straight up here. It's an amazing story to me. Amazing story. The 1930s Agriculture Museum is open to the public without admission, but you have to make arrangements first. You can do that by Googling 1930s Agriculture Museum. This has been another Muddy River Gem brought to you by Dot Foods. Thanks for watching. This episode of Muddy River Gems was brought to you by Dot Foods.